Greetings! Welcome to part two. We're talking the origins of science. Okay, so when we're talking about science, we really want to kind of uh, think about what's going on and what our kind of real goals are. Uh, so science, discovering how the world works, you know, that's nice, but there's a real goal, and the real goal is to get stuff that works and does cool stuff. You know, cell phones are pretty nice. Fire is, you know, compared to not having it, pretty awesome. Uh, so throughout human history, we've wanted to gain technology that could build useful stuff, whether it be a cell phone or a satellite, uh, a spear, fire, you know, cooked food, that kind of stuff. Uh, so we've got a couple ways of thinking about doing this. And one approach is we create what's... Uh, I would like to refer to as the model. And it's not just the model, you know, we have multiple ones, but it's our idea of how the world works. We understand the way the world works, and from that we can then start saying, okay, if this and this, if this is how it works, then I could be able to do this stuff, and that stuff that I'm doing, the ability me to think of how to build stuff, that's technology, and then once I build, use technology, I build stuff. So if I'm thinking, okay, you know, when rocks hit each other, sparks take place, then I can think, well, if I can take a flint and a piece of iron, I hit them together, I get sparks, that's technology, I actually do it, and I get fire. Yay, fire's useful. Uh, so we're going to be looking for how do we get new and cool stuff to make our life better, because everyone wants their life to be better, either to make their life better or to make somebody else's life better and have them pay you for it, because, you know, money. So, since antiquity, we've got a couple of ways of doing things. One, we can simply watch, see what happens. Uh, and that can be quite, uh, quite helpful. Uh, we know that the animals walk this way during the winter, and we find, you know, maybe some nice wintering grounds. We follow the animals. Uh, or we go see where they go and find that they've got a nice salt reserve or a nice water supply. Also, that the seasons change. Uh, and that one can help us build technology and help us understand how the world works. And on the model to ancient civilizations may not have been what we think of it. It wasn't being mathematical equations. That's usually what we think of now. Mathematical equations, computer simulations, that kind of stuff. But for ancient civilizations, that could easily have been things like myths and legends. If you think of uh, the Greek myth of Persephone, I uh, hope I got that right. Anyways, uh, you know, she would go into the underworld for part of the year and then come out into the, you know, normal world for the other part, and that was their explanation of the seasons. Obviously, yeah, seasons got nothing to do with some lady eating seeds in the underworld. Uh, but that did give them enough thought to say, okay, winter is going to last so long and summer is going to last so long. And that's important. When do you plant? How long of a summer do you have? Those are important things to start thinking about. And as we understand more, our models become more complicated. And at that time, you know, once again, myth and legend, but myth and legend leads themselves to scholarly work, etc. Additionally, trial and error. I start beating rocks together, I realize I can break flakes off. Okay, that's kind of cool. I beat them together more, and all of a sudden, hey, you know what? I get sharp edges. We're still doing trial and error like crazy. It is a time-tested, proven way of getting new stuff. Just beat things together, see what happens. Uh, sometimes there's nothing better. Uh, so a nice and old classic one. But there are limits. This is nice, but you know we need to make things a little bit more sorted out. Well, starting around the Greeks, and this is why the Greeks get a lot of credit, but starting once civilization really catches hold, we get alphabets and writing, which is huge, we start to get this idea of systemization and aggregation. So we've got these myths, these legends, let's start writing them down, let's start sorting them out, let's start getting patterns, let's start making lists of stuff. List of stuff is actually insanely important. We have the whole, you know, encyclopedists who are trying to make encyclopedias of all knowledge. It doesn't help you if you have a bunch of knowledge, but you don't have it. It's all scattered around. Uh, a lot of credit needs to go to the Islamic scholars of the Dark, or what in Europe would be the Dark Ages. It would be Golden Ages uh, for the Middle East. Uh, they were situated between India and Europe, um, which you know had Greece, uh, so we're able to take information from Greece, from China, and from India, uh, and aggregate those together, as well, of course, from Rome. 
uh, a lot of the caliphates would have book bounties where if a book that was new to the uh, region came through, it had to be copied and the person would get uh, you know, some cash. And if they didn't, they would get thrown in jail or something. But they really wanted to collect knowledge. And what they were able to do is take Greek uh, geometry and pair them with Indian numerals. Indian numerals are what we call ro uh, Arabic numerals. Uh, can you imagine trying to do algebra with Roman numerals? Ugh. Well, you don't. In fact, algebra gets created once we start seeing Greek uh, geometry and start pairing that with Indian numerals, uh, which made things much more useful. So the Islamic scholars really start clumping things together, systemizing them. We get a lot of really cool, uh, interesting uh, Technology is starting to be discovered and written down at that time. Most of our basic chemistry techniques are actually in writing by Arabic scholars by the 8th or 9th century uh, AD. Now, we move into the 17th century. And we get the slow method of moving in and developing what we now call the scientific method. It did not just, boom, appear one day. No one person simply wrote it out from nothing. Uh, nothing starts from nothing. You always build upon that which was before you. Uh, but the idea was this focus on experimentation. During the Middle Ages, it was all about, and really before, it was all about rhetoric and logic. You, truth was known by how you argued it since the time of the Greeks. But you can argue things that are wrong. You can argue that a feather will fall slower than a rock in a vacuum. The, they don't. They fall at the same speed. But you can argue that. And you can win the argument even though you're wrong. Well, the motion moved on to, the idea moved into experimentation. I don't care how good your argument is. Does it actually do it? Does it actually happen? And as that took place, we moved into the scientific method, which was to start screening all that we knew. Because we had to do a whole lot of stuff, and we knew that there were those things we knew we knew, there was those things we knew we didn't knew, and then there was that stuff that we knew we knew that just wasn't true. And so we needed to sort that mess out and purge those ideas that were just plain wrong, because it was starting to, to muddle us down with just junk. So we needed to start sorting out things, start purging the wrong information. And the scientific method was a great tool and is a great tool for doing that to really ask the question, do you really know what you think you know? Uh, so we get the scientific revolution. It slowly grows over around the 17th century. Uh, once again, you can start putting dates on things, and it's, it's kind of a fuzzy thing. So you can start arguing uh, 16th century. It's definitely by the end of the 17th century uh, in at least a basic form. Uh, science originates from a school of thought called natural philosophy since the time of the Greeks. There was this idea of, you know, you had your metaphysics, you know, what was the meaning of the world, etc. But then you also had natural philosophy, how does the world work? Uh, highest degree in the sciences is still called the Doctorate of Philosophy. That's what the PhD stands for. I was thinking, the goal was here to sort out inaccurate knowledge. And to do that, first of all, there's one, one thing we want to do is think about, well, what is inaccurate knowledge? And we come into a couple ideas. And first are two types of errors. Uh, one is the type 1 error. And that's where we see it, a pattern where there is none. And... You know, a nice example to that would be, let's say you're walking in the wilderness and, you know, you may be in a jungle and there's a big, giant, poofy grass thing. And the grass rustles and, <laughs> and you're like, ah, tiger, run, duh. But there wasn't a tiger. You saw some rustling. You're thinking, oh, no, it's a tiger, but there's no tiger. So you look like an idiot. Type 2 error is the reverse. You see a pattern, or you don't see the pattern where there is one. So you're walking through the woods. You see the grass. It's rustling. You're like, oh, the grass is rustling, and then, and you're eaten, because there was a tiger there. Well, a type 1 error, for you personally, is much better to make than a type 2 error, because a type 1 error, you duck and you look like an idiot, which is a whole lot better than being cat food, which is what you would if you had made a type 2 error. But as a society, because type 2 errors tend to compound, we have to avoid those. Uh, so now all of a sudden, that's how you get superstitions. Like, okay, you know, cat crossed my path, and then, you know, something bad happened to me, so I now dodge cats. Well, no, it was just, the cat had nothing to do with anything. Uh, whereas the type 1 error, if you keep running into the wall, and you don't get why you run into the wall, eventually you're going to get it. 
And then it's like, oh, I need to stop running into the wall. Now my head doesn't hurt as much. Yay. So type 1 errors don't compound. You just keep trying over and over again. Eventually someone's going to see the pattern. Uh, so we're, we are in, you know, naturally imbued to go towards type 1, but as a society we need to bias towards uh, type 2 errors. Okay, so let's pull in the scientific method. Uh, this is the way we're going to bias towards a type 2 and away from a type 1 instead of what we want to do. Uh, but this is going to limit us. So what we do is we take the model, we take our understanding of the world, everything we know, everything that we get our hands on. A lot of science is reading other people's work. We take that and we form a hypothesis. The hypothesis is always going to be an if-then statement. If something or other happens, then this will occur. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that something or other happen, and I'll see what occurs. If I'm right, yay. If not, then I've got to change my understanding of the world. Now, I will be honest. A lot of science does not strictly use scientific method. It will use more of a trial and error and an exploring and an observation approach. Uh, simply because we don't have enough of a model in order to generate an, a hypothesis. You've got to build that model by one way or another, and sometimes it's going to be observation, trial and error, etc. Uh, anyways, once you get that hypothesis, then you figure out an experiment. The key part of that experiment, though, is it has to be able to prove you wrong. If your hypothesis is wrong, it has to be able to show that. Uh, you can't set up an experiment which will always have one answer. It's like, I think there are invisible ghosts. I'll do this experiment. Oh, I couldn't find them, therefore they're invisible, therefore... No! It's like, <laughs> you have to set it up so it's falsifiable. Now, that also, however, means, though, there's a lot of questions we can't ask with science. So if you, you think there are invisible ghosts, whatever, you can't ask that question until you figure out a way that you would definitely find them. Um, if you think they're unfindable, then you can't ask that science, uh, question with science. You could ask it, you know, with the humanities, etc., but you can't f ask that question with science. And then, once you get results from your experiment, you feed that back into your model. You start expanding your model. You use that to refine and perfect your model. Uh, obviously, if it's just like, yep, that's right, that's, you know, it's like, okay, that's good. I've got confidence. That gives me weight of evidence, but it doesn't really change my model. If I, it's a little bit off, then all of a sudden, like, okay, I need to reformat my model. I need to change the way I think the world works, because the way I think the world works obviously isn't the way the world works. Now, uh, once again, though, we've got a couple of limitations. You've got to generate a hypothesis, and your experiment has to be able to disprove the hypothesis. If you can't, then it's not going to work. Uh, also, it really has to be on something that you can, you know, have a hypothesis. It needs to be an if-then statement that's nice concrete. So we're not going to be able to ask questions like, uh, what is ethical? What's the meaning of life? There's just no way to design an experiment for this stuff. Uh, these are critical questions. These are some of the most important questions humanity has ever grasped with. However, science is not the tool for that. You know, we might be a hammer or a screwdriver, but these are not nails or screws. They're, you know, they're bolts or something. So this is going to be left to the humanities. And, you know, not to disparage them. They're dealing with absolutely critical questions. They're just not the questions that, as science, or that science itself can deal with. Now, in the 19th century and beyond, really in the uh, mid to late 19th century, well, once again, this is all slow evolution taking place. Well, not really that slow, but it's, it's, you know, it's a continuum. There's no clear clicks. Uh, we start with the Industrial Revolution. And, and the Industrial Revolution had taken place years l before this, uh, but it really starts hitting chemistry and the sciences. What we realize is that by building the model and building technology, we can make new stuff, and we can make a kill, and we can make money, money, money on this one. And that feeds money into the process. Science is inherently expensive. Where you look at the great scientific advancements at any given time, that is generally the most affluent parts of the planet. So once you go back to, say, 600 BC, that's going to be Greece. Greece was doing really good at that time. Once you're moving up into the Middle Ages, it's going to be the Islamic Caliphates because they were doing really good at that time. Once you move into the 19th, 20th century, you're looking at Europe, uh, mostly Europe, and then into the 20th century, then you're looking at quite a bit of the U.S. because those are the time periods where those societies were the, the strongest and richest. And expense is expensive. Now, the other thing, though, is science... Uh, it's expensive, and you have to be, have a justification for, for doing it. Uh, J.P. Morgan once said uh, that everyone has two reasons, the good reason and the real reason. 
And science always has this great good reason to understand the world. To, th and that's nice. But the real reason is what drives things. And up until around the 19th century, the real reason was rich people were bored. Uh, rich people wanted to prove that they were better than everyone else. Uh, that kind of real reason. And, you know, that can move a lot of money. Uh, but not nearly as much as people realize that they can make a lot of money with it. So in the 19th century, all of a sudden that real reason moved from boredom and prestige to profit and power. Because the societies realized that <laughs> if you had cool new weapons, you could conquer other societies. And so things just started taking off. Uh, it's been said that approximately 90% of scientists who have ever lived are alive. Don't have citation for that, I'm afraid. Uh, now, with that, we also started seeing a break into two f groups of science, the pure and the applied. Applied science is trying to grow the model very specifically to target a very specific question. Basically, technology needs to know a small amount extra in our model in order to make the cool stuff. So we grow that model in that direction. Uh, if you start thinking about drug companies, they know how the, the disease works. They need to grow the technology, they need to grow the model, and understand how a specific part of the disease interacts so they can figure out the drug that cure it. This is traditionally done by for-profit companies. The turnaround between applied science, understanding, knowing where you're going, and knowing where you are, and trying to bridge that gap is usually fairly short. And, you know, for-profit companies, they got to make profit. You know, it's a capitalistic system, you know, money goes in, you need to get money to come back out. Uh, so they want a quick turnaround time. So this, and the quick turnaround time still might be 5, 10, 20 years, but it's fairly short turnaround time. Now, pure science is simply trying to grow the model. There is no end goal. We don't know where this model is going to lead. We're simply trying to grow it so that later we can then figure out where we could go and close the gaps. Pure science, model building, is generally funded by governments. Uh, it's going to usually be conducted in the U.S. at universities, a few specialized research labs, uh, goes a couple other places. The reason governments do this is a couple of fold. One, any research in this is such a slow turnaround time that it's going to help someone, but you never know who it's going to help. So, you know, if you're, if you're a for-profit company and you help the competitor, that doesn't help you. <laughs> you didn't want to do that. But if you are a government, you want to help everyone around you. And even if you do help, you know, other nations, they might then help you. And, you know, it's a little bit more uh, public good oriented. The other issue, and the reason it's done quite often in universities, is that scientists need to be trained. As a society, you want a fairly decent number of scientists because your for-profit companies want to hire them so that they can be used to make tons and tons of money. Well, you got to train them, they got to do something uh, to train, and a fairly straightforward way is you s send the tr budding junior scientists and you stick them on the pure science problems, trying to grow the model. That way they become trained on that one. And then about 60% of chemists, 60 plus percent, uh, different fields vary differently, will then go into the for-profit sector. After they've learned and cut their teeth on the pure uh, science, they then move into the applied and start growing the economy in that way. Once again, y if you're a government, you want lots of trained scientists so your companies do well. Uh, you don't really want... You know, your company sitting there going, well, we could make tons of money if we had anyone to hire, but we don't. Uh, so we're going to move to some other country. Now, when we move into chemistry, uh, it's got a similar track to a lot of the sciences, although it came in kind of late uh, to the game. So there's kind of three areas where it came from. Metallurgy is definitely one where chemistry developed from, although metallurgy stayed its own separate science. And there's a couple of areas where we're going to cover and, let, and we're going to stop really quick and say, you know what, that's covered in metallurgy, which is usually handled by the engineers. Uh, but that's the art and science of working with metals. From the moment you start casting the very first copper things and beating the first gold trinkets, we've begun metallurgy. Apothecary, uh, which basically evolved into pharmacology. Uh, actually, if you go to Europe, some places will call their pharmacists apothecaries still. But art and business of creating medical treatments f uh, traditionally from natural sources. So apothecary would be from natural sources. Obviously, now we've moved <laughs> past just natural sources. But the one we usually start thinking about of is alchemy. 
And alchemy is the art of purifying natural substances into their essence, creating new substances. Uh, and of course, you can think of that as you know, kind of the perfumer's uh, trade. So you take, say, rose petals, put them in with some alcohol, boil them, get off the uh, vapors, and that now smells like rose. So you can take the smell of 10,000 roses and put them on your neck, uh, if you so choose desire. Unfortunately, alchemy, alchemy was steeped in mysticism, um, partially because, once again, the sciences hadn't diverged here. Uh, the scientific method hadn't come around, so questions were being asked that were more metaphysical, more spiritual in nature, that were not scientific in nature. Also, a lot of the mysticism was a way of doing trade secrets. Patent law did not exist <laughs> uh, up until relatively recently. Uh, so you wanted to conceal and hide what you were saying. Uh, so instead of saying what you worked with, you had you know special names. So instead of some random herb, you called it Eye of Newt. Eye of Newt is not the eye of a salamander. It's it's actually a herb. Uh, we did gain some practical benefits though. Uh, fields such as medicine, dyeing was a major one. Uh, ceramics all grew from alchem alchemical research. Uh, and we had a lot of our basic techniques, but it was still really looked down on because it was still uh, very frequently looked at as, as being kind of a magic, non-scientific pursuit for a very long time. Chemistry, you, we can say it was born in 1661. Once again, this is sticking a date on something that slowly evolved. But in 1661, there was something rather important. That was the publication of The Skeptical Chemist by Lord Robert Boyle. By say Lord Robert Boyle, I mean he was an English lord. He had land, owner, uh, land of himself. He rented out to tenant farmers. The guy was filthy rich. He did not need money. Uh, and he did a couple things that was somewhat different, but it was heavily influenced by the fact that he didn't need money. He was not trying to get rich, or as many of the other alchemists were, because they, you know, they weren't filthy rich to start with. So he publishes this as Skeptical Chemist, and Skeptical Chemist does two things that are completely opposite of what you would do to try and make money. First, it's written in plain English. It is not coded. It is not encrypted. It is just in English. You can still read it today. Obviously, 1661, it's going to sound a little funny, but, you know, you can still read it today. Uh, not too much worse than Shakespeare. Uh, it also gave sufficient details to reproduce the experiments. Not only was he bragging about what he did, he told the reader how to do what he did. The reader could do what Boyle had done. And this creates a precedence. All of a sudden, you are writing in a way and communicating your ideas in a way that the reader can understand, and they can test you. They can check to see if you're right. We're now moving in. Not only do we have experimentation, but we get other people experimenting and being able to reproduce or not reproduce your right, uh, uh, work, depending on how you're doing. 1791. Okay, this is near, uh, so over 100 years later. We get the first industrialized chemical production. The Industrial Revolution has kicked full force at the verge of the 19th century. Not quite, but very nearly. This is for making washing soda. Washing soda is a uh, alkaline uh, material used to make soap. Uh, the way you make soap is you take fat, you put uh, something that's very alkaline, and it separates the fatty acids from the glycerin, and then the fatty acids are your soap. Well, you need the alkaline stuff. Also, you can use it straight uh, for certain cleaning production. Now, it turns out the LeBlanc process is an environmental disaster. The byproduct is hydrochloric acid and it's just sent up a chimney. It's, it's origin of some of the first uh, clean air laws. It's an absolute disaster. was replaced as soon as we had a different way of doing it. But this was the first way of making washing soda, uh, really any chemical, uh, in bulk as an industrial for-profit practice. Now we move into the middle of the 19th century and we get a, an event. We've had many other events. Once again, these are just kind of three major points across the pathway. Some folks would pick different ones, some pick, pick more, some would pick less. But uh, the synthesis of mauvine, and that uh, picture is of mauvine over there that's a piece of silk, uh, as well as a letter written to a uh, dye manufacturer, I believe, uh, about this. And mauvine is a synthetic dye. Traditionally, dyes had to come from something. You know, you took up and you ground up uh, parasites that grew on prickly pear to get cochineal. It's, it's a ground up bug. Uh, you might uh, take certain plants and boil them to make things like indigo. 
Uh, now, if you wanted purple, you had to get some predatory sea snails off the southern and eastern coast of the Mediterranean and squish them. It's a pain to go hunt snails. Uh, so purple was insanely expensive, the color of royalty. Mauvian is made from coal tar. Coal tar is a waste byproduct of the uh, gaslight industry, which was big at that time. You know, the you know, little, little gas lights, not the same thing as natural gas, though. Uh, anyways, he's been able to basically be able to make this out of scrap or, or of uh, trash, uh, and thus you're able to make a product for very little that has a very high value. And we get the synthesis of Mauvian. Uh, turns out it was actually an accidental synthesis. The uh, researcher was trying to make quinine, which is a, a drug used to treat malaria. But he still made a fortune. And through these productions, especially towards the Mauvian, chemistry had had the, you know, the, the specter of alchemy on it, but was able to lose that specter, which people <laughs> realized, this isn't magic, this is profitable. And, you know, money speaks loudly. Well, that's really all we're going to jump into, the origins of chemistry and science. Uh, next, we're going to kick into a little bit more of the unit, uh, so see you there.